back in the 80s. Uh, when he came here as an associate of David Wilkerson, they came to the Bayfront Auditorium. And Bob, you don't even remember meeting me, but I, I remember meeting you. And uh, I was a Navy chaplain stationed at one of the, uh, the command chaplain at, at one of the naval bases here and, and uh, went to that meeting. And uh, that was my first introduction to uh, Bob Phillips. And uh, I remember David Wilkerson making some very positive uh, s statements about this man, his character, his ministry, and so forth. And um, uh, I was impressed with what David, w David Wilkerson said because I, I trust his evaluation of, uh, of people because he's dealt with enough human nature that he has some keen insights. And uh, it wasn't until the, uh, well into the revival that uh, suddenly Bob Phillips shows up here and uh, through the, the years that he's been here, a couple of years now, um, I've had the opportunity to uh, interface with him as a fellow faculty member on the staff of the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry uh, and as a fellow member of the board of directors of that school uh, and uh, as uh, he has integrated himself into the life of the church here and has preached to us on many occasions and entered into the ministry of our church and fit right in, he and his family. His son and my grandson are about the same age and, and they became close friends. And so through those associations, we uh, had even closer interface. And, and I can tell you today that uh, it's a privilege of mine to, um, to be a, a friend and colleague with, um, uh, with Bob Phillips. And uh, you're going to, uh, to be blessed today as he comes and shares keen insights. This man uh, is a student of the Word. Um, he is a theologian. Um, he's a Southern Baptist by background. God bless his heart. <laughs> but then so am I. <laughs> and uh, we both graduated from, uh, from uh, Baptist seminaries. He from Southern, I believe, up in Louisville, which is the liberal one. And, uh, and me from New Orleans, which is the conservative one. <laughs> And uh, so uh, this man is a true theologian, a true man of God, and a prince in the kingdom of God. And he has such a warm and caring spirit and such a caring heart. And uh, we're thrilled and happy that he's a part of the church here and a part of our school of ministry and that he's going to be your speaker this afternoon. And so uh, I, I just recommend him to you with uh, no reservations whatsoever. And you're going to be tremendously blessed. And so would you welcome Bob Phillips, please. Yet. Am I on now? Well, I, I know uh, Pastor Kerry would agree with me that regardless of liberal or, uh, or, uh, or conservative, neither one of us learned enough to keep us afloat. We just needed a lot more than what we got, and I just praise God that he didn't leave us where we were. Amen? I, it wasn't Richard's message an awesome message, you know, just to remind us. I, I tell you the privilege of being able to have your children uh, in that kind of an environment that he brings to the youth is an awesome thing. And uh, I just praise God for him and, uh, and, and for the staff around here. Uh, you know, God is doing something that, uh, that I, I, I want us to concentrate on. I, I, if you open your, I want to try to stay close to the notes and because how, how many of you believe, now let me ask you this, I want you to ask God, how many of you really believe that whatever God promises, no matter how fantastic it may seem, it must be true? Do you really believe that? Because I'm, I'm about to read some things to you in a little bit about some of the most fantastic promises that I think that we could possibly look at in the Word of God. I'm eventually going to end up in Psalm 68, that's where we're going. But before, before we go there, I just want to share with you some things that I think are foundational uh, to getting into this. When God moves, one of the things that I remember when I was at Times Square Church, I remember this cry coming up from inside my heart. Basically, uh, not that David Wilkerson is ready to retire, I don't mean that, but I saw him aging. 
I, I don't mean that in a negative way, but I, I saw him. Leonard Ravenhill was still alive at that point. There were other men who had been touched by God in mighty ways, who'd seen an outpouring of God's Spirit, whether it was way back in the, uh, uh, the brush arbors or wherever it was. And I began to cry out as I met more and more men that had seen much more than I had, had seen in, in, uh, in my lifetime. And I thought, Lord, where are the people that are going to carry this generation into the next generation and Lord will you leave us without a witness and I remember crying out to God many many times in prayer and saying God we've got to have a fresh witness of your spirit because I knew there were things of the spirit I certainly didn't know anything about and I knew that there was not a whole lot of people that would experience little pieces and touches of God but where was a sustained move of God that literally shook things well I saw many churches that had a longing for the power of God but not many churches that had the power of God I mean we had some great meetings and we had some wonderful conferences and we had some wonderful revival meetings we called them but where were those things that used to come years ago, either in early Pentecost, uh, where God just came in. I mean, he just arrested everybody, handcuffed them, and then began to just move without any restriction whatsoever. And so I began to cry out, Lord, where are they? And uh, then I would read a scripture like this one. Don't turn to these verses until uh, I ask you to, because when you get there, I'll be gone. But uh, I, I, like Psalm 89 verse 1, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. And I saw, God, I'll do that. I mean, I know you're faithful. Regardless of what I've seen or experienced, you are faithful. That doesn't change that. Whether I experience it or not does not change it. But God, I'll declare that. But oh, how I long to see it. How I long to experience it. How I long to move in it. To know what it feels like. To know what it looks like. To be able to declare with a confidence. How many of you know you can know something and not know it? Isn't that right? You can know something and not know it. God, how are we going to declare your faithfulness to all generations? We know you're faithful. It's got to be more than just saying, God, you're faithful. You know, I, I think of, for example, I go back in my mind to, to uh, Darius. Now, now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. You know, Daniel, particularly Daniel uh, chapter 6, you don't need to turn there either. Okay, but, but think about Darius. I, I love this story, but I, I want, you to, want you to think about it a little bit because Darius is a heathen king. There's nothing to indicate that Darius knows the Lord at all, but he loves Daniel. And so, you know, the governors and the satraps begin to formulate an opinion and they, and they, they get him to pass a law. And uh, in that law, it, basically what happens is that he says, um, he says, if, if uh, you know, you cannot bow down or pray to any other god. You have to pray only to the gods that are there of Babylon. Now, what happens is this. The law passes, the king knows. He knows Daniel prays every day. He loves Daniel. Now, here's a heathen king that loves Daniel. I'm going to make an illustration of this in just a moment. He loves Daniel. And so he has to pass this law. He does. And immediately the satraps and the governors, they begin to come and they say, here's Daniel. He's already broken the law. I like it because he says, Daniel, having known the law had been passed, went up to his window, opened the window and began to pray. All right, now here's the man who's unconventional. I mean, he's standing for God no matter what's happening. Now here's, I believe there are a lot of Dariuses that are out there waiting for the church to stand up and prove that God is faithful. See, we know he's faithful. We know, we're going to declare, God, you're faithful. But there are a lot of Dariuses out there that are saying, now here's where I get that. They're saying, is God faithful? So Darius in Daniel 6, 16 goes to Daniel and he says, Daniel, I love this story. He says, Daniel, <laughs> uh, while he's in the lion's den, he leans over the edge and he looks down into the lion's den and he says, Daniel, I know that the God whom you serve continually is able to deliver you. <laughs> well, that's really kind of you, Darius. <laughs> You're up there, I'm down here in the lion's den. You see, he, Daniel's saying this, so, I mean, uh, Darius is saying this, and he's looking down into this place, and he's saying, Daniel, don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. I know. I've watched you, Daniel. 
and I've watched you serve your God. And I just want you to know, Daniel, that I just want to declare that I believe that your God is able to deliver you. I believe there's a world out there looking at the church, waiting for some people to rise up and say, hey, I believe your God's real. Now, the Bible says that he could not sleep at all. He had the dancers, the musicians. He didn't want them around him. He had a restless night. The next morning, he gets up, Daniel 6, 20. He gets up the next morning, and he runs, he runs uh, to, the, to the pit, and he looks down, and he says, Daniel, was your God, now look at the language, whom you serve continually able to deliver you? You know what that tells me? It tells me that there are Dariuses out there that are saying they're lost and they don't know God, but they want to believe that everything we say about God is true. They want to believe that the testimony of the church, that God is able to deliver, God's able to change your habits, God's able to heal your marriage, God's able to do this, God's able to do that. They're out there. I'm telling you, they're out there in great numbers, and they may appear, some of them may appear to be very rebellious against the church, but down inside, they're saying, please. You know what I think Darius was saying? Daniel, I know he's able to deliver you. Oh, please let it be so. Daniel, I know this God that you've worshipped and walked with continually. I know he's different than any of the gods of Babylon. I know he's different than anything we've ever touched. Oh, please let it be so. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I believe there's a world out there, and that's where they are. That's where they are. We can declare, or we can sing of your faithfulness, God. We can sing of your faithfulness. But how many of you know that the songs that we sing of the faithfulness are not bringing in droves the Dariuses into the church? I don't care how good the music is. So God is rising up. He's rising up. He's rising up to do something different. I believe God's after more in revival than just simply blessing us with a good service. I believe he's after more than laying us on the carpet, as much as I appreciate that. I have a young man from Houston, little boy. He's about 12 years old. He came here last weekend, and I've been helping a church in Houston. And so he came here this weekend, and he was touched, and he said to me, he came up to me, he said, Pastor Bob, he said, you know, I said, Jesus, now this 12-year-old boy, he said, I've never, I've never, he saw people being slain in the spirit, and he looked around, and he says, Jesus, I don't know what that feels like. I don't know, he's, he's a saved boy, but he said, I don't know what that feels like. I, what, could, what could that be? He said, Jesus, I just love for you to do that to me. About that time, somebody walked by and bam, there he went. And now he didn't just fall. Let me tell you something, he was out cold for about 15 minutes. He doesn't remember anything of that 15 minutes. Doesn't remember anything. See, that wasn't a courtesy fall. <laughs> okay. That was the real deal, okay? And that little boy wanted to experience the power of God. Now, I don't know. Maybe he will never be slain in the Spirit again. Maybe he will. Maybe it will be a common occurrence. I don't know. But something about the faithfulness of God has been driven into his heart. Jesus, would you do that for me? Bam! Am I making any sense to you? And the world is out there waiting. See, uh, it's easy for Darius, but let me tell you something. I also believe there's another element to that story. I believe that in order for God to prove to the Dariuses that God is faithful to all generations, I believe that we have to somehow experience the lion's den. Are you hearing me? I believe we've got to get into those situations. I believe God's, I don't think you have to pray for them. I believe God will find one for you. I believe he'll even select the lions. And they might be real hungry. Let me tell you something. I am convinced that God spoke this to my heart in prayer. Throughout generation after generation after generation, the study of revivals, the study of church history, you can see this manifested over and over again. That God has for a period of time held open doors. I don't care if you go to China, you're talking about seminary. I remember when a man by the name of C.I. Culpepper, who was uh, one of the, the foremost persons used in the Shantung revival came to Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. He spoke to a chapel of just hundreds of students. And so, and then afterwards,
afterwards it was said, do you, uh, those students that want to go to talk to Dr. Culpepper, he will be at such and such a room, uh, he will be there, and he'll answer your questions. And I looked at my schedule and I heard the time when he was, and I had a class. It was an important class. As a matter of fact, it was, I remember very vividly, it was the class that we had for the review for the exam, the midterm exam. Uh, it was the review for that exam just prior. The exam was going to be the next week. And I looked at that schedule, and I heard what he said about how God moved so mightily in revival. I listened to what he said about earth-shaking things, things that I've never seen. But I believed they were true, and I saw that. And so I said, that's it. That's it. I don't care what I do. That exam, I'll do the best I can, but I have got to go sit and talk to this man. So I went to that room, and I expected it to be hundreds of people there. I got there. There were seven people there. Later on, two more came that made it nine. Now, the good part <laughs> was I got to sit for two, two and a half hours at the feet of a man who had seen the earth-shattering Shantung revival. And I got to listen to what he said. I got to hear his heart. I got to ask questions, and I can remember sitting there. You see, I wasn't just a young kid because I didn't go to seminary until I was an adult. I, I went to seminary after I had been in business for a number of years. I owned my own business, and God arrested me and took me out of that, and I was in seminary. And so I, I was sitting there not as just a young kid, but there's not a young kid anywhere that could have had more wonder in his eyes than I had sitting and listening to him. Am I making sense to you? But I want to tell you something. He also made sure he told of the things that he went through. Like losing two children because they were murdered because of revival. I remember that. I remember saying, God, can I do this? I mean, is this what you would require? I wasn't married at the time. I was single. I didn't get married until I was 35 years old. So there's hope for some of you that maybe not be married. But look at me. I found a beautiful wife. But let me tell you something. The problem there was there was not really an interest in the supernatural. Richard touched on it. Why don't we have the supernatural? I believe not only do our motives I want to know how much we really want the supernatural. The motives that Richard talked about are right. But how, many, how much hunger? Now, I believe it speaks of you being here, speaks of some of the hunger that would be in your heart. But what I'm talking about is that if we want to touch the Darius's of the world, if we're going to make an influence on the world, you can bet on this, there will be a lion's den. Now, here's what I was going to say to you earlier. God has held things back. I believe in church history will verify this, that there have been doors that are open in China. The Shantung revival, God ripped open a door. He just ripped it open, and there it was. But before long, that door closed. The communists closed that door. I wonder how long Russia will be open. I don't know. But let me tell you what I believe is happening that's different. I believe that we have a different program with God. You'll see in your notes, one of the things that I start with is the time is now. Why? Because this is a different generation. And the scripture does say in Psalm 119 verse 90, Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Do you understand that what we're experiencing is more than revival? We're experiencing the faithfulness of God to this generation to declare himself and to manifest himself. Now that's an awesome thing. Because the question I have to ask now is not is God going to sovereignly move in revival. The question I have to ask myself is how much of himself does he want to disclose? Are you hearing me? I believe the program of God has changed. I believe now God's arms are wide open. And I don't believe the doors are going to close this time. I believe God's doing a unique thing in this generation. I believe he may be prepared to, prepare, to display more of himself to this generation than any generation that's ever existed. I believe that. And I'll tell you something. Maybe I'm wrong, but I sure will go after him to see if I'm wrong. And I'll experience more than I ever would if I had sat down and said, no, maybe it's another generation. I'm saying for this generation in which we live right now, God is awesomely prepared to display himself. And here's what I believe. It's taken me a long time to get this out, but it's, 
I believe that God is now holding the doors open. I don't think the issue, I don't think the issue now is will the doors close? I believe the issue is who's going to go through the doors? I tell you, I've determined this. I don't know how big or how small my door is. That's not for me to determine, but I will determine, and I can say this, I don't want anybody going through my door. Now, that's not a selfish statement. I want to experience what God's got. I believe he's disclosing himself. That's why I'm saying to you the time is different and the time is now. It's for this generation. God did not begin to display himself at Brownsville and at other places simply to say, I want to do this for five years. I want to do this for six years. I want to do this for two years. God is saying, I'm ready to disclose myself to this generation. I believe that's where we have to start. And all, again, I say with a wonder, because it just, I get excited about it. God, how much are you going to show? How much? I talk to people all the time. As Richard began to speak about, I, I watched you. I just looked out over this congregation and I watched you. And when he would come to a certain place where he talked about God just opening himself up, there was an excitement. Sometimes there was a cheer. There was something that moved you. Why do you think that's there? It didn't come from your flesh. It's not something you dreamed up. It's not so. If you have gotten to the end of your rope where you're sick and tired of things as normal, my question to you, who got you there? If you're in a lion's den and he's even been chewing on you a little bit, who put you in that place? Why did he do it? Because he's saying, I want to use you to declare to a Darius somewhere that yes, God is not only faithful, the God whom you serve continually will display and manifest himself. There are Dariuses that are up there. They're out there. They're looking down at you. They're watching your church. They're watching you. And they say, is it all right? Is he going to make it? Did God prove himself faithful? Now, if all we do is just go to church on Sunday, and all we do is just simply have religion as usual, Darius is not even going to ask the question. Are you hearing me? I say, are you hearing me? So is it possible that some of you here even today are in a lion's den or you've been in one that you didn't understand? And what God is saying is, I need a witness to declare to a generation my faithfulness. Oh, I'm going to do something different. I'm holding the doors open. I'm tired of them closing because I couldn't find the people. I'm tired of them closing because I couldn't find anybody to go through them. I've got a different tactic. I'm holding them open and I'm going to raise somebody up if I have to do it overnight. I'm going to raise somebody up to go through that door. I believe that's what he's declaring to us. The time is now. But you see, I think we have to, I have to think that this hour is an hour when we must know our enemy. How many of you ever, you, know, you women, I don't expect a positive answer, although I might get one. <laughs> women are into kickboxing now. How many have ever shadow boxed? The women, how many? Roger has. Any other men you ever shadow box? Let me tell you something about shadow boxing. It's wonderful. Nobody can beat you. Muhammad Ali, you got a better shuffle than he's got. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I, you know, Holyfield, no match for you when you're shadow boxing. The only problem is when you get into the ring with a Mike Tyson, you might get your ear bitten off. When you get into the real battle, you get your ear bitten off. I'm simply saying to you that the church has been shadow boxing for too long. We've been shadow boxing of things. We don't lose those battles. We come before we come before the world and we stand up and we sing our songs and they're wonderful songs. I, I'm not saying that we change the worship. I tell you one thing I've learned about learned about God. You study the history of revival. God has worked through all kinds of worship. It's not Brownsville worship. There's a man here as a pastor from Wales. Well, I want to tell you something. He, it wasn't Brownsville worship that brought the 1904-1905 revival. God can work through anything. He doesn't have to catch up to the modern thing. He's not catching up. He's leading. <clears throat> There's a lot of talk about being warriors. I'm going to show you this in the scripture, I believe, in a moment. I believe we ought to be warriors. But when I read the scriptures, I got something that bothers me. 
because we've been proclaiming how mighty we are in warriorship. Now that's probably not a word, but that's the nice thing about preaching and teaching. You can just make them up as you go. <laughs> Nobody ever checks them out, you see. How many times have you ever heard somebody say a word and you went home and checked the dictionary to see if it was even a word? You don't do that. So that means that when you're preaching and teaching, you just make them up. People won't check you out, you see. They think you're smart. You think it's a new word. <clears throat> Let me tell you what I think God intends for us to be. I, for, in fact, this is what I got out of the message last night. You know what I believe God wants us to be? I believe we are to be warriors. I believe we are to be fighters. That's evident in Scripture. But you know, when God presents something, it's like a diamond. It's got more than one facet to it. If you only see one side of it, you don't see the whole diamond. Let me tell you what I believe God wants us to be. I believe He's looking for war correspondents. You know what war correspondents do? They watch the battle and report what's being done. We somehow have gotten that mentality, send us revival, send us a mighty outpouring of God, and God will go forth, and we'll just take the world. I'm going to tell you something. God doesn't need us to lead on the front lines. He needs us to follow and record and report what He is doing and what He has done. God is looking for a body of people that will be war correspondents. They will publish the mighty acts of God. They will declare the mighty acts of God to this generation. Not because we're out there causing strongholds to crumble and causing all of these things. I believe there's a place for fighting, but we need to be war correspondents as well as warriors. In fact, we need to be war correspondents first. Because when we get in the right position with God, He will go before us and he will declare himself and manifest himself, his faithfulness to every generation, to the point what we'll be doing, it would just be publishing what he does. He heals somebody over here. We just stand up and say, whoa, look at that. Oh, God, we, look at what you did. Uh, people get saved, and that happens here. I believe that the, baptismal, that we, the baptisms that we have in this pool are more war correspondents than they are warriors. Because what happens is we sit back and we'd watch, and somebody would share something. The power of God would hit. In Mexico City, I've seen the same thing. There's a place there. I, uh, I, wasn't, I was there not long ago, and they baptized 2,100 people. In one time, he, this, this, this uh, ex-Catholic priest read in the Scriptures where that 3,000 were baptized in a day, and he had gotten saved, he was fresh, and he thought to himself, well, if I'm going to baptize 3,000, I need a big pool. And so he designed a pool that would baptize 120 people at a time. And I, I saw it, it was about 40% of them are slain in the Spirit. I guess you call that, I don't know what you call it when it's water, slain in the Spirit. I, but anyway, they would go into the water, and then they, would, they, 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 they wouldn't come back up. Somebody had to get them underneath the arms and lift up. Can, can you imagine seeing this? I, I'm, I'm just, I just want you to understand. Can you imagine seeing this? What happens is, so out of 120, you know, you, you've got somewhere between 40 and 60 that, that are literally having to be helped out of the water. And so what you see is you see that the catchers are now catching in water. They're baptizing and catching water. They got them underneath their arms and they're dragging them. They're laying limp like this in the water and they're dragging them over to the side. Now you got another group of people that are lifting them out of the water and laying them over in the glass until they come to I'm just saying it because God is moving in an awesome way. He's making a declaration. Well, I want you to turn with me to Psalm 68 because I asked you a question. I said, if we were to read something in the Bible that is so dramatic, so fantastic, would you believe it? Would you believe it? Because I believe that this chapter is one of the most fantastic chapters that I see anywhere in the Scriptures. It's awesome. It starts out, it starts out with a cry. Now, I'm sure that probably many of you have read this. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so that the wicked perish at the presence of God. Now, these two verses declare two things. 
Number one, it's a cry for change. But the interesting thing about it is it's not as it appears to sound. When I hear the words, let God arise, at first to me it was like a cry saying, God, please arise. Let God come up. But that's not what it is. In fact, it's really probably taken from Numbers chapter 10, verse 35, when Moses began to see the cloud begin to move. Now listen, he didn't shout before the cloud moved or the pillar of fire. He didn't say, let the fire rise. He didn't say, let the cloud arise. He waited until he saw it and then he published it. He proclaimed it. John Kilpatrick, uh, uh, I was meeting with him the other day and, and we were just talking about some things and he added a little thing. I wouldn't have had this if I hadn't have heard this from him because I'd forgotten it, but it sort of lit this message for me. I was, I was saying to him that before we learn anything, there comes two, two important elements of learning anything. If we're really going to learn it, one is instruction and the other one is example. And, and I was just simply saying that we have got to have not only the instruction. Church, we've been instructing for a long time. That's coming from a teacher. I'm a teacher. I'm not a prophet. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not a, uh, an evangelist. I'm, I'm not an apostle. I'm a teacher. And so I'm not going to knock teaching because that's what I love to do. And so, but I want you to understand I'm also tired of teaching without the demonstration. I'm tired of just instructing and instructing and instructing and instructing. We've got so much instruction. In fact, we've instructed so much, we have literally have a God who's for sale as far as the world's concerned. Will we package him right? We put things together. We have the right campaign to let him know that this is who he is. This is what he does. It's how wonderful he is. This is how great and mighty he is. There's, no, there's not an absence of people proclaiming the greatness of God, is there? Talk to me. Is there? No. You can turn on any TV. You can turn on any radio station. I'm not knocking those ministries. You can go to any church, most any church. You can go to a lot of churches and you'll hear something about the greatness of Almighty God, the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, how magnificent he is. We're proclaiming, we're instructing to the people, but what this generation must have, what this generation must have is a demonstration that he is faithful. I believe there's a hunger. You want to know why I believe revival's happening? Because I believe there's a hunger out there, not only in the United States, but in other places, of the riots that are crying out, please let it be so. Please let it be so. Oh, please, what they're saying, pl please, don't, don't let it be just another religious service. Don't let it be just, uh, uh, they believe the Bible, but I don't know about it yet. Please let it be so. And so God is arising. So here comes this cry, let God arise. It is not a cry, please bring revival. It's not that at all. I mean, there are cries for that, but that's not the cry. That's why I say I believe God, instead of opening things and then letting them close, I believe he's holding them open and he's looking for people that will follow him. And he said, I'm going to hold them open. I've got some people assigned to go through this door. If they don't go through it, I'll find me somebody else. I'll get a 12-year-old boy. I'll get somebody off the streets. I'll get somebody that never heard a word of the gospel. But they will believe me and they will go through this door. And there will be people sitting in church all their lives that will never go through the door that I open. They won't even know they missed it. I don't want to do that. Let God arise. Moses would wait until he saw the pillar of fire. He waited until he saw the cloud move. And then he proclaimed, and that's the word that John, that John Kilpatrick gave to me. He proclaimed. See, what John was saying to me is that, yes, yes, Bob, there's a need for instruction and there's a need for demonstration but what we're missing is the proclamation the proclamation is I thought we were preaching it's not preaching it's not teaching it's following God with such an anticipation not from what has passed but with a declaration of what he's doing right now and so the cry, let God arise, 
is not so much a cry, God, please move. It's a cry that says, oh, God's moving. And if we don't recognize that cry, I don't think we'll experience much. You don't have to raise your hands on this, but how many of you search your heart? How many of you are really convinced? Don't raise your hands. How many of you are really, truly convinced that God is already arisen? I'm not talking about from the grave. I'm talking about moving now. And so he's calling. When he arises, what happened was this. I, I, you know, how many of you realize that he might have camped at a place in the wilderness when this cry was uttered? It might have been for a day. It might have been for a week. It might have been for a month. It might have been for two or three days. I, do you think everybody wanted to move? Some of you women, you just got the things unpacked. You got the trunk unpacked. Husband just got up the tent, okay? It's, you, you did it in the morning, and here it is, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and you hear Moses, and you hear the shofar. Well, let God arise! Arise, oh God! And, and, and I'm sure there was someone who says, No! I'm not moving! Or if you're planning on us going, you pack it up again. Now, now get real. I mean, get real. I mean, do you think that may have happened? We read these stories and think, oh, everybody just got everything. Nobody grumbled. Nobody did anything. You see, even, well, yeah, but you see, they saw the fire and they saw the cloud. You know they would move. No, because we get accustomed to things real quick. You move us five or six times and we say, I don't care about the cloud. I don't care about the fire. I'm tired of changing. Why can't God make up his mind? Where's this fire going anyway? I wonder what it'd be like. I believe I could survive a night in the desert without this cloud. See, what, what we don't realize is that when he moves, his provision goes with him. And so does his presence. And so whatever excuse that we may have to say, you know, I don't know if my people are ready for it yet. Now, if they're not, understand if he's moving, then you get left with the people that are not ready if you don't go on. And the presence and the provision of God, they go on without you. Because there's no provision in here for saying, God, wait a minute! Do you ever read one time in there where the cloud went up and then all of a sudden it just shot right back down? Because somebody was holding on saying, I, we're not ready quite, you're just not ready yet. So you packed up what you had and you left or you left it behind. And see, maybe some of us need to leave some stuff behind. Well, let God arise. And then God says, if I can find the people who will follow me when I arise, if I can just find them. Now, here's the fantastic part in a moment. He mentions three enemies. On the front of this little booklet that you have is a little statement. And here's what it says. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6, 12. There it is, articles of war. So as I'm saying to pastors and Christian workers and wives of pastors and Christian workers and anybody else that might be here, first of all, when I mention these three categories, none of them really refer to a person. But that doesn't mean God won't allow the devil to use a person. But the enemy can never become the person because if we don't identify clearly. See, we have pastors and pastors of churches have been beaten so long because a lot of times people don't want to go. I find this about Christians. It seems to be pretty consistent. Christians have a tendency to fear what they do not understand. And then what they fear, they criticize. So you have to understand that when people within the church begin to criticize, it's not always, it could be, because there's some people who say, my tent is not moving. And they're quite content. Do you understand they're quite content for the church to stay exactly like it has been? They don't care if it's moving or not. They don't care if the presence of God is here or not. As far as they're concerned, they've had the presence of God all their lives. They grew up Assembly of God, they grew up Baptist, they grew up Presbyterian. What do you mean we need something more? What's wrong with what we've got? Now, he begins to define three enemies. I want you to look at those quickly. The first enemy 
that he defines. He says, let God arise, which we understand to mean, let's get going, get packed and move because he is moving whether we like it or not. And then the next thing that happens is it says, and let his enemies be scattered. And now that word for enemies is the word adversary. And I do believe that it, re it, res it, res it corresponds directly to satanic opposition. And that's the first opposition to hit you. You see, when you begin to move with God, he will try to bring satanic opposition to you. He'll try to bring fear. Now, I tell you, Satan's major weapons are fear and propaganda. You read Revelation chapter 13 and you'll see two beasts. One is a land beast, the other is a sea beast. The sea beast is mentioned first. And the sea beast, the sea beast is a patchwork of, of a lion and a bear and a leopard. All beasts. And you get in a room alone with them and you're going to be where Daniel was. A patchwork of anything that can bring fear and intimidation to your life. That's the first thing he'll bring against you. Pastors, listen to me. That's the first thing he'll do. But understand, there was a Daniel before you who went into a lion's den, and there was a Darius that said, he said, okay, Daniel, the God whom you serve, is it all right with you? And Daniel says, oh, king, it is good because the glory of God came into this place, and he shut the mouth of the lion. God would never, amazing God, awesome God, Oh, he loves his people so much. What do you, how do you think he loves his shepherds? Who he sent? Why? I'm not saying he loves the shepherds more than he loves the people. I'm not saying that. I'm not implying that. But I am saying, how, how much does he love the shepherds? How much? He, he, he did call you. If you volunteered for the ministry and you didn't get a call, you, you need to get out because the work's too tough. But he did call you. Even if you've doubted your call many times, you see, it's because, and I'll, I'll, I'll say why we're doubting the call is because we have become warriors that feel like we got to take the city, we got to take the land, and we're not war correspondents enough. So we're just simply commenting on what God has done. Do you understand if God ever gets us to the place? I've been in the ministry 32 years. Do you know something? Out of those 32 years, if there's anything I have learned, it is this. I have not been adequate for anything. And when I thought I was adequate for it, it usually didn't go anywhere. Unless God blessed me and then broke me and showed me to get out of the way so he could go and arise. Is that pretty, is that pretty common experience in the ministry? The things that we work on, the programs and the plans that we work on, the working so good brings in all the people. And before long, we bring in the people, but we don't have the presence. And then the very people we bring in are the ones that chew on the ear during the boxing match. You know what I'm saying? I remember, I remember one time in the ministry, I remember working with this lady. She said, Pastor Bob, please, please help me. Please help me. I said, well, what can I do? She said, I want to learn how to hear the voice of God. And I said, well, you know, I'm learning that myself. But I have, I have made some progress, and I'll share with you what I So I got with her and her husband, and, and, we, and I had a special Bible study, because I, I hadn't had, it was a small church, and I didn't have many people asking me that question, Carrie. I want to learn to hear God's voice. This is fantastic. Wow. We'll get this one hearing the voice of God, and then she'll infect another one hearing the voice of God, and then she'll infect another. Before long, we'll have revival in the church. And there was an uprising. You know what? The uprising was over. I asked the elders of the church if they would sit. This is a tiny church. Well, we had maybe 200, 250 people. I asked them if they wouldn't mind sitting along this bench along the side so that the people could see the elders and I wanted to move the elders into ministry. Okay, we had five elders, three of them, put their finger in my face and says, who do you think you are telling us where to sit? I thought, where did that come from? And so I explained to them what I, see, I, I didn't have much boldness then. I didn't, I didn't have much boldness. I, I, was, I, I was intimidated. 
And so, I, you know, I tried to accommodate. I tried to do what I could to accommodate. I said, well, you know, I, I still want him to sit up front. And out of that, I won't go into the details, but out of that, there arose a disruption in the church that brought it to the place of being very close to a church split because I asked some elders to sit in a place in the church. It became a battle for authority. The adversary was at work. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You see, the second word that it uses, and I'll tell you the end of the story in just a moment. The second word that it uses, look at this. It says, <clears throat> as smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so that the wicked perish at the presence of God. But verse 1, I missed it. Let them also that hate him flee before him. Now, the King James translates this a little differently. I'm reading the King James there. But in Psalm 81, verse 15, it makes a powerful statement. I've checked it out, and it is closer to the original language that we want to look. And it says, those who hate the Lord pretend obedience to him. Now, the reason we know that that's an accurate translation is because we can go to John and we can find out that those who love the Lord do what? Keep his commandments. There are a lot of people that hate the Lord. They're not God-haters the way we would see on the streets. I'm telling you, the Dariuses and the God-haters would love to declare that God is real if they could see Him real. They'll, they'll flock to the church. That's what's happened in this revival. They have flocked because they've seen the reality of God. They've seen a witness to this generation. And it's not over. But there are those sitting in the church that say, I will obey you, God. I'll follow you. I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll sing the songs. I'll, I, and I'm not talking about just the churches that, that have the more sedate music. I'm also talking about the full-blown Pentecostal and charismatic churches that just sing and dance and move and prance and everything else. And that's wonderful. But I tell you, you let their will cross God's will strong enough, and there are many of them who are pretending obedience all along. Am I making any sense to you? Have you, have you ever thought about why God brings us to bitter waters? When God was taking the children of Israel from Egypt, an impossible situation, the first place he brought them to was a place named Marah because the waters were bitter. I shared this the other day. I want to share it again. But you know why God brings us to trials, the lion's den, to bitter waters? It's so that the poison, the water was poisoned, and they had to throw a tree. Isn't that a picture? They had to throw a tree into the waters to sweeten it. The tree, of course, is a picture of the cross. God will bring us to a lion's den. He'll bring us to a place of bitterness. He'll bring us to a place of difficulty because he wants to teach us how to throw the cross into the midst of that so that we learn to die to living for ourselves. Let me give you a little example. The other day, my wife and I were... Uh, we were going to have lunch together, and the kids were all with somebody else, and I love my kids, but I love my wife too, and so I was just looking for a wonderful outing. And so we were driving on this very, very, very busy road, and the place where we wanted to eat was on this side of the road, and so here we were driving along, and I stopped, and I thought, well, you know, I, I, the traffic was so heavy, and I thought, I, I want to, honey, I'm going to go up about a block, and a block, a block and a half, and I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to come back. She said, oh, but you may never get across up there. There's no place to turn. I, why don't you just pull off right here? So I was right at the place where I had to turn off. So instead of being able to pull my car over and get in the lane, I had to pull it just like this. So what that meant was that the tail end of the car was halfway in the lane, that people wanted to go by. And people would go by and they, they I mean, they'd hit their horns. They'd go, ee! one guy, one guy, I mean, he wanted to make sure I heard him for a whole block. Ee! I mean, all the way, he was way past me and still had his hand on his horn. And so I, I thought, it's, it's all right. It's all right. It's my fault. It's my fault. Because, I, I mean, I wouldn't like it either with this kind of traffic and people having to slow down and hear the tail end of my cars out blocking the traffic. It's all right. It's all right. It's no problem. It's no problem. And I understand why they're upset. And you know, it just kept, they'd honk, and I felt something. I, I know nobody else has this problem, but I felt something just sort of rise up, just a little, just a tiny bit, just, just a little bit, you know. And, and then I said, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right, it's no problem, no problem. And then another, e -e 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 -e. it's my fault, it's my fault. But I feel something building on the inside. 
Okay? So finally, this one lady that was behind me had not honked once. She had not honked once. It was a nice, wonderful day, so the windows were down. She had not honked once, and I appreciated that. But when I finally got over a little bit, she pulled around me, and with the windows down, she said, she didn't say anything horrible. She said, thank you. And shooting out from somewhere unknown was these words back, you're welcome. And about that time, the traffic cleared a little bit, and I was able to pull the car over, and I got over to where we were going to eat. And there's my wife. There's the cross. <laughs> thrown into the bitter waters. And she said, honey, now that wasn't right. You didn't have to say that. She said, after all, it was your fault. You were crossways. My fault? No. It's your fault. I was going to go block and a half up and turn around and come back and be on the right side, and you told me to turn right here. Now, I didn't say it like that to her. That cross is too sharp. I know better. You know. She'd have gone to carry or somebody and said, let me tell you about my husband. Would you please pray for him, work for him? He's got to get this temper gone. But you know, you know why it was dangerous for me? Because listen to me, because I was never on drugs. I, I didn't even drink. I mean, I might have tasted something when I was young, a teenager or something, but I didn't like the taste of whiskey or beer or anything like that. So I didn't have that. My drug of choice was anger. My drug of choice. And see, Satan knew. That, see, and years ago, and I won't go into the story, but years ago, my anger used to be so explosive. Oh, I'm not on drugs. But God will bring you, he'll use the enemy, he'll use Satan, he'll use an enemy, because what will happen is he'll cause the lion's den. Why do you think he puts you in the lion's den? I, I don't believe this. I don't believe. Now, I know God tested, I know he tested Abraham. I know he did. And I know that when he provided the ram in the bush, I know that he says, now I know that you fear me. I know that. But I don't believe God goes around throwing us against the wall and says, let's see if they stick. I don't believe he does that. I, I really don't. You know, somebody said, thank God. Amen. I, I, I hope he's not doing that. <laughs> no, but I believe God does do this. I believe that he knows that the cross and the bitter waters will reveal the poison that's in us. And so he allows the lions in, and he allows, he allows the adversary, and he allows those people that hate the Lord that pretend obedience. I told you the story. I said I'd get back to it. I haven't forgotten it. I taught this little lady how to hear the voice of God. One day she came to me and she said, Pastor Bob, I'm hearing from God. I'm, oh, I'm, she was so excited. She was literally, she's going, I remember the day she, she went like this, I'm hearing from God. And she told me what she heard. And, and, and she was right on target. Until the elders decided they didn't want to sit in this area. And then the problem started. Then everybody had a complaint. Because see, what happened was it didn't bring up that complaint. It brought up everybody's complaint. Because we were moving with God. God was beginning to move. Had nothing to do with where the elders had to sit. You know what? So we had a meeting. The elders literally called me, the pastor called me before the whole congregation and said, I didn't even know it. It was after service. And I finished the sermon. We had the invitation. And three or four elders jumped up and said, hold it. The service is not over. We have to have a meeting. They had called people. and I wondered why the crowd was so big that Sunday. And so, so they got up, and here's what they said. They got up and they said, Pastor Bob, we got this and this and this and this and this against you, and we don't like where you're taking us. Now, let me tell you something. Literally, they stood in front of me. There were five elders, and they had five people that joined them, ten people standing there. And, oh, this is precious. I mean, every once in a while, God lets you get back at people. Okay? <laughs> this is precious. They stood up, and we, we talked a little bit. I should have closed the meeting right there, but I wasn't smart enough. So what happened was we had 10 people said, and finally one of the 10 said, Pastor, who do you think you are? You think you're right all the time? Could 10 good men be wrong? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. <laughs> and he said, well, as a, I said, well, as a matter of fact, there were 10 good spies that went into the land, and they were very wrong. 
needless to say, it didn't solve the argument. See, that's the next enemy that, that, that God will bring when, I mean, the enemy that he will allow when, when, the, when the power and presence of God starts to move. Now, now look, look at this. He says, he says, let the righteous be glad. Or excuse me. He says, uh, let the wicked perish at the presence of God. You know, the word wicked there is not wicked evil people. They are wicked. In it, but it means, if you check the word out, it means that which causes confusion. And so what happens is confusion starts. When you decide to move on with God, confusion. If, God, if God's moving and the enemy can do something in a church, he'll try to create confusion. Am I making any sense to you? Okay. Now, what, what blew me away when I saw this is God's answer to the whole thing. God's answer was not fight the darkness. His answer was light it up. His answer was start a fire. Let the fire burn strong enough. And all those enemies will melt like wax. And if there's any smoke left over, the wind of the Holy Spirit will blow that away. And so, especially the pastors, you wonder, how do I deal with this sort of thing? How do I deal with the trouble? Some of you may not face that, but how do I deal with it? Light the fire. Stop trying to fight the darkness. Light it up. Because when you light the darkness up, what will happen is there will be enough people that will come running to the light of that fire. They'll come running to it because you know what's happening? When the fire lights up, people's bondages fall off. You may have to build a new church. But I'll tell you something, it'll be based upon people that are going after the fire. Light the darkness up. Keep going after the presence of God. Keep moving forward. Don't let confusion, don't let those who pretend obedience, and don't let the adversary deter you. And you know what God will do? We've got a little more time. I love this part. There's a lot in here I love. But I love this part. Look at this. Immediately it says, Let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them rejoice, ex exceedingly rejoice. Sing unto God. Sing praises to His name. Extol Him that rideth upon the heavens by His name, Yah. You see, we sing all of these songs. How many of you ever heard a song come out of some of this? Now, now look, I know you're looking at the notes and I'm not very far. But I want you to see what God begins to break down in this psalm. You know what I like about this psalm? What I love about this psalm is the only part that man plays in the whole psalm is to pro proclaim. The rest of it is all God's activity. Are you hearing me? The whole psalm is God's activity. That's why I'm saying we need some war correspondence in the body of Christ where we can declare how the war is going. Now, now look at this. Am I making any sense to you? The first thing he says, verse 5, he breaks some categories down. Here's what he says he'll be. A father of the fatherless. You, you know what I, let, let me just t take it a little, and I don't think this is stretching it. Those of you that are pastors and Christian workers, do you understand that what God intends you to develop is sons? God says, I'll come in first of all and I'll begin to father you. I, I think that's an awesome thing. But, but you see, when he says a father of the fatherless, what's he offering us? Well, I, I believe, I believe he's offering us a security. A security. Now, I, I could preach a whole message on the fact, and you would agree with it, that the body of Christ is full of fatherless people. But I'm turning this differently, and what I'm saying to you is, why do you think, why do you think Daniel was placed in the lion's den? Because Darius needed a spiritual father. He already believed in Daniel as a person, but he needed a spiritual father. 
He needs, what does a father do? A father is somebody. I remember years ago reading this story about a plane crash that was in Alaska. And, and, the, and the plane crashed and, and, uh, and there was this little boy that was, and, and, a man, and the pilot were coming out. And they, got, they went across cold tundra. They went across snow and ice and everything. And it was difficult for them. And the reporters, when they got finally to a place, a camp, uh, they were rescued and then taken into the hospital and they're interviewing the little boy and they asked the little boy weren't you afraid during all of that journey and the little boy says no I really wasn't and they thought that's kind of preposterous that's that's a little bit too much to believe they said well why weren't you afraid because the pilot is my daddy and so his daddy was leading him not just a man but his daddy not just a pilot, but his father. See, I believe that as we take the stand we're supposed to take, let God arise, and we go after him without abandonment, I'm telling you, the promise of God is that what he will begin to do, listen to me, is he'll start giving you sons and daughters that are hungry for God. He becomes a father to the fatherless. Now, what do you think he's going to do with the fatherless? Putting him in an orphanage? No, because he's already declared, I will not leave you as an orphan, but I will come to you with a dwelling place. What he'll do is that he will transform you and me into spiritual fathers so that the people the church is built off is spiritual sons and daughters. And then he says, a judge to the widows. So first of all, he offers security for you because all of a sudden he begins to build. If he has to, I'm telling you, if he has to, he'll build a new congregation. And some of you may say, well, that, I'm fearful of that. I, I'm going to get to the thunder in a minute. It's in here. So don't worry about it, okay? It's in this chapter. The only reason it's thundering outside is because God knows we're getting to that verse and he knows that I only have a few more minutes and he's, he's just reminding me, hurry up and get to the thunder, okay? So don't worry about the storm outside or anything else. That's all that's happening. All right, now, <clears throat> what's a widow? What does a widow need? What does a widow need more than anything else? She, she, needs, she needs protection. She needs somebody to care for her. God says, if you allow me to arise... I'll make you a father and I'll bring you some sons and daughters that'll be so hungry for me. And I'm going to bring you some widows. I'm going to bring you some people that are so vulnerable. They're going to run because you're not trying to fight the darkness. You're lighting it up. And so where the widow's going to go, they're going to run to where they're not vulnerable anymore. Am I making any sense to you? And then, and then he says, he has another group here. Look at this. A father of the fatherless, verse 5, judge of the widows is the God in his holy habitation. God setteth the solitary in families. Well, now the word is lonely. What, what's God going to do? God's going to take the lonely. May, may I say this to you? You know what I think one of the purposes of this conference is? If I were you, if I didn't have somebody that was going after revival with all their heart, if I didn't have somebody that I knew that, was, that I could call and talk to that would encourage me and build me up and speak to me and say, let me tell you what God did. Let me tell you what happened in prayer. If I didn't have one, I'd find one before I left this conference. If I had to go up to them and say, excuse me, excuse me, Frank, are you going after God with all your heart? Yes, sir. Now, don't lie to me. To You're going after God with all your heart. Yep. Would you be my friend? Could I exchange phone numbers? Can I talk with you from time to time? Because I'm kind of lonely out there because where I am, I don't see somebody going after God quite like that. And I need somebody. God says, I'll find you somebody to stand with you. I'll find somebody to fight with you. I don't care if he's in California and you're in New Jersey. Are you with me? When God sees the hunger, he'll start looking out for the lonely 
and the solitary, and he'll settle in families. That's what he's doing. He's bringing together those that are going after God with an abandonment with all of their hearts. And if you don't have somebody like that, ask him, find one before you leave here. Exchange, make a pen pals or whatever you have to do. But just make sure you get somebody to talk to you and to encourage you and to stand with you. Now listen, listen. And by the way, Frank, I didn't believe that you weren't telling the truth. I was trying to illustrate a heart of just saying, okay, thank you. Now, now look what he says. God sitteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those who are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Those, what's the rebellious? Say, I'm not rebellious. It starts with the first words of this psalm. God, let God arise. I'm telling you, if you don't see it, then maybe God will excuse you. If you don't really see that God's moving, maybe God won't hold you accountable. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe he won't. But if you think for one moment that God's doing something unusual, if you think for one moment that God's on the move, if you're convinced he's moved one place and you don't go after him, you are the rebellious. You are the rebellious. You know what God will do when he finds somebody ready to go on with him? Now look at this because I want to jump down a little bit. Look what he says he'll do. Look at verse 7. Oh God... When thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness, the earth shook. The heavens dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You know what he's saying? When I find somebody that's going to walk, study the history, where he drew this from. When I find somebody that's going to walk after me and go after me like that, when I find somebody, I'll move three things. Number one, I will move the earth. He says, I'll move the earth. The mountain quaked. The thunder came. He says, I'll, I'll, shake, the, I'll shake whatever I've got to shake. Oh, I want to drop down for just a moment. And then we'll come back to that. Verse 9. Thou, O God, didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. Listen, listen. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the journey through the wilderness. I have searched. I've read the Psalms. I've read every scripture. It may be in there, but I cannot find one single record of when it rained while they were in the wilderness. And yet that's what he's talking about. Are you hearing me? He said, God will send forth a plentiful rain when you cause Sinai to quake, when you cause the earth to move. What was he talking about? Well, let me tell you, the word send is an interesting word because it literally means, so you can check this out for yourself, it literally means to wave back and forth. How many have ever had a bag uh, and it had some stuff in it, and you got most of the stuff out, but you couldn't get all of it out, and you knew something was still lodged in there. How many of you ever took that bag, held it upside down, grabbed the corners of the bag, and shook it and waved it back and forth so everything would come out? That's the word. God says, I will literally take the earth, and I'll shake it back and forth until a plentiful rain. The, the rain was the quail. It was the water out of the rock. I'm telling you, it was one thing after another. It was the manna. It was everything. God says, I will send a plentiful rain. That's what he's saying. I'll shake it and I'll shake it. And the word plentiful is not plentiful at all. It means a willing gift. Now something's wrong. Something's wrong. Either I am failing to communicate this to you or you're really, really tired. Because whether I'm a good teacher or a poor teacher, there ought to be a shout about that somewhere. Because I said, do you believe it? Do you believe it? You may be in the lion's den for a while. God, if he can get us to have an encounter with him. You know what I like about the story? of Joshua, 
facing the walls of Jericho? Joshua 6 verse 2 has this little bitty quote in it. He brings Joshua and it says in verse 1, it says that the walls were tightly shut. The whole place was secured. And then he says, he brought Joshua and then he says, I love this. He said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hands. Now, you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> no. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Lord, I see walls. I see a city tightly shut. I, as a matter of fact, I don't see what you see. But Joshua didn't say that. That's what I would have expected. Would you? I mean, think of it. Would you? If you were facing the walls of Jericho, would you, would you have said, if God says, you see? Well, let's put it on a, a, on a, take your biggest battle that you may be going through right now or that you've recently encountered. And when God begin to encourage you. When you begin to stand in the pulpit and preach sermons about how God was a mighty God and how He could do all these things, and then you had to look at your own walls, and you had to look at your own place or the own thing you're going at, if God had said, you see, 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 I've already given it to you. I've, I've been there before where I couldn't say, yes, Lord, I see. What was the difference? In Joshua chapter 5, the eve before the invasion, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joshua. And he says, whose side are you on? Joshua said that. Whose side are you on? And the angel of the Lord, which I believe was none other than a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, stood there and he said, neither. You make the decision. Whose side are you on? See, we have been doing our best to get God to be on our side. God, why didn't you do that? Why didn't you allow that to happen to me? God, why didn't you move? I did all the right things. I did everything they do at Brownsville. I did everything else. I did everything you've told me. God, why? Because the only thing missing is Joshua had a fresh encounter with the holiness of God that he'd never had before. Now, maybe he must have had some encounters because with Moses, he used to stand at the tent of the meeting when God would stand up and he would declare his faithfulness in his voice. He would stand there. But now, before he takes Jericho, before he takes the most strategic city so he can go in, shatter the gates to that land, and take the occupied territory. Before he does that, he requires a fresh encounter with the presence of the angel of the Lord that is so strong that he has to take his shoes off because suddenly he realizes he's standing before holy God. And I'm saying to you, not only do we need that kind of an encounter, but oh, please understand the reason you're here is because crying out on the inside of you is something for that kind of encounter. And it did not come from you. God placed it there. Your flesh did not come to this place so that the Holy Spirit could examine you deeply and cut you up in little pieces and show you everything about you that you... Listen, how, how many of you understand that when God is moving like this, you announce a conference to say, come and Lord, come and see everything the Lord exposed about me. Go to your church next week and announce a conference. Over here's going to be the conference of all the things God's going to do to bless you. Over here's the conference and you're holding it. And you say, come on, come on, everybody come. We're putting flyers and posters all over the city because what we're wanting is everybody come and let God expose your sins. Come on, just come on to this conference. How big is your meeting going to be? Now listen to me. You've heard about Brownsville. You've heard about sin. You've heard about those things. You've heard about the move of the Holy Spirit. And you're here. This is what I'm trying to say to you. How did you get here? Because you're just like me. You're going to be a little reluctant to run to anything where God's going to expose everything about you. Unless God has done something on the inside of you first. Are you hearing me? The reason you're here, some of you, I don't know if you're first time or if you're back again, but if you're back again, that's even worse. 
He came by, glutton for punishment. God rips you up the first time. Or, or, or you say, well, I was here and nothing really happened to me. Well, that's probably even worse. You're really a glutton for punishment. You came back and you said, God, you know, you didn't do anything, but I'm not letting go of you. I, I, I want whatever you got to do inside me. Do it. And what I'm trying to encourage you with, as well as challenge you, is that you come to the understanding that you did not make a decision like that with your flesh. Something of the Spirit of God had to arise. I don't care if it was a challenge. Some of you might, people do that. They come and say, well, I'm just going to see if it's all real. I'm going to see what God wants to do. That was God. He may have used the lion's den to get you here. I've said this many times. We come to God one of two ways. By attraction or by affliction. Sometimes God will draw us by attraction because we see the beauty and the wonder of God. we just got to have more. But unfortunately, most of us started with affliction. Am I telling the truth? Most of us, I mean, some people do. Most of us didn't just throw up our sails and catch the wind and say, Oh, the sweet presence of the Lord, that's what I want. Usually it was some kind of affliction that drove us to throw the sails up, even get in the boat. And I'm saying to you that God has you here because some way, affliction, attraction, some way he's done something so that you're crying to God. That did not come from you. It did, I don't care how weak or strong, it did not come from you. Somehow, God began to arise, and you begin to say, Martha, fold the tent. Or maybe Martha said to Joe, fold the tent. We're going. Do you understand? What God did was he sent a rain, a plentiful rain. Look at this. I, I want to come to a close. Thou, verse 9, O God, didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. This is the King James, but isn't that an awesome statement? I don't know if you've ever seen that before. God now says, I'll take you from where you are, and I will confirm my inheritance to you. You, you, you know, I want to be a Levite. Because they did not have an inheritance among the people. The Lord himself was their inheritance. That's what I want. I want him. Not a ministry. Not a ministry. Not any recognition. Now, there's times when my flesh wants some recognition. Y'all don't have that problem either, I'm sure. But it happens. Awesome promises. I don't have time to go through them. But God says he'll go to war for you. you. You know, you can read this later, but you know what God used to cause the children of Israel to go forward? You know what he used? The Bible says you read it carefully. Now, there's a list of things here about articles of war. I was too ambitious in thinking I could get all of this done. But, but read them. Because these are the things that God will require of you to go on. First of all, he, he'll move before you to defeat your enemies. But you must be willing to be apprehended, handcuffed by God. You must expect the enemy's resistance and pursuit. Now, let, let me tell you something. In the time of advancement and battle, your heart will be revealed. See, most of us have this erroneous idea that we reach a level of spiritual maturity and then we go on and do battle. That's not the Scriptures. It didn't happen with Paul. It didn't happen in the Old Testament. What happens is you go into battle, and when you get into the battle, you find out how much of a coward you are. When God, now listen to this, I don't have time to turn there, but Exodus chapter 13 and 14 are pivotal scriptures, chapters. What God did, you remember the story? God took the children of Israel. They, br they brought them up to a bank, mountain on this side, mountain on this side, the chariot behind them, and the Red Sea in front of them. Now, Hebrews eleven twenty nine 29 says, by faith they crossed the Red Sea. But you read the account, 
and you find out what produced the faith. Because they stood there when they got in that position. Now listen to me because this speaks to some of you. When they got in that position, they declared, we're not going forward, Moses. What did you do? Did God bring us out here to have us be destroyed? I don't call that faith. They didn't wait till they got to the wilderness to say that. Read it. They said it on the other side of the Red Sea. Now, what was it when they were saying that? Listen to me. When they were saying that, there was a huge curtain behind them called darkness. I mean, literally, God had a curtain of darkness. So dark you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. Between the Egyptian army and then between, uh, between the Egyptian army and, and the Israelites. And it said that the darkness and the light never came together. Now listen, it was dark on this side where the Egyptians were, and it was light on this side. What a miracle. Do you know what caused the Israelites to go across the Red Sea? Read it. God lifted the curtain of the darkness. And they turn around and look, and here they are. And sometimes God puts you in a situation and he has to lift the curtain so you see the enemy clearly. Let me tell you something. The reason they didn't want to, you know why they went across? They had more faith at that moment in the destruction that Pharaoh could cause than the Red Sea opening. And sometimes God calling you forth puts you in a place where you've got more faith in what the enemy could do to you. And when the curtain opens and you're no longer in the secure spot, you might be in the lion's den, but you're, the curtain of darkness opens and, whoa, there's the enemy. You're looking him right in the eye. You know what you're going to do? Whoa, look out water. Here I come. Because <laughs> it's the only place you can go. You're too out of shape to climb the mountain. I believe God has some of you in that kind of place. Now, I'm going to close with this one, but I, I love this one. Exodus 14, 25. Now, you have to check it out for yourself. I don't know how accurate it is, but it says this, that when the, when the, when the chariots begin to go across and chase them, when the chariots begin to chase them, this is awesome. When the chariots begin to chase them, here's what happens. The King James says that their wheels fell off. Okay? All right. But it's, I think it gets better than that. The New American Standard says he caused their wheels to swerve so that they could not direct the chariots. You know what Moffat said? The word literally means to make ineffective. Moffat translates it this way, and then he says he makes a good, he makes a good argument for this translation. And he says that the wheels turned square. <laughs> How'd you like to pull a chariot with the wheels square? <laughs> Turn sideways. So instead of rolling like this, they're mm, plowing and plowing. God did that. You don't have to get excited about it. I am. God did that. And God promises to do it for you. He'll cause whatever the enemy's doing. Not only will he hold back, he may lift the curtain to get you to look. To, oh, I've got to go forward. And moving, you could be going through something even now in your church and in your own personal life. And you see the darkness of the enemy. He's held off right now. Don't be surprised if when you get home, he takes the curtain, lifts it up, and there he is staring you right in the face. And you say, I've got one place to go. I don't know. I'm not a good swimmer, but here I go. And you go forward. And God will use that to drive you forward. And then when the enemy pursues you, if he has to, he'll turn the chariots sideways. Let me tell you something. You can't even turn your horse around when you have square wheels. Are you with me? And then God will cause, regardless of what the translation is, you can check it out. It means that he made the chariots wheels ineffective. I'm not going to have an invitation, but I, I want you to do this. I want you to just, you don't have to bow your heads, you don't have to do anything, but I, I do want to close. i got about three minutes. God can do a quick work. 
And I, I want you just, I just want you to acknowledge, if any of this has made sense to you, if you find yourself in that kind of a predicament, you heard God arise and you came after him, and you didn't do it on your own, it wasn't your flesh, it was God calling you, don't lose hold of that. Do not, do not lose your grip on that, that you're here. Even if you're rebellious, you're here because something stirred you to say, God, it's not enough. It wasn't. So what it means, if God stirred you to do that, he's not going to leave you without meeting what he wants to accomplish in your life. And you read the notes, and you'll find that God then begins to bring a habitation to that person. And the next thing, he starts avenging them. He puts them in a place of security. And, and, so, and he fights until finally he's on the throne of your heart. And he's now conquering everything that stands in the way. That's his promise. I want to pray for those of you who say, I know it's either the lion's den, or you're, you're there at that place. I'm telling you, there's a Darius that's watching you. Might be, it might be one of those rebellious persons in your church. It might be a relative. It might be a son. You know, it might be a son that's turned away from God. Oh, I find so many pastor's sons that have turned away from God, pastor's daughters that have turned away from God. And regardless of what's been there, they're a Darius. They're crying out in their hearts saying, oh, you look at them and it looks like they're just rebellious. And what they're looking at is they're for whatever reason, for whatever reason, they're looking and saying, oh, please let it be real. Please let it be true. Somebody in your church looks and says, please let it be true. And you look at yourself and you're like Joshua and he says, do you see? And you're saying, no, God, as a matter of fact, I don't see my way through this. I don't see the church being effective. I don't see revival. I don't see what you're saying. I don't, I, we're a long way off. I, do you see? But you see, God says, let me bring you to the encounter with me the eve before the invasion. Because I know when the invasion is going to take place. I, and you know, isn't God amazing? I mean, come on. Read the instructions that Joshua got for the walls. Come on. Read the instructions. Could anything make less sense to you? I mean, you've read the final part of the story, but if you were there, come on. God is so simple and yet so complex. But his instructions to us are always so simple. I want you just to lift your hand if you say, I'm ready to go forward. I'm ready to go forward. Now, now, don't lift it if you're already going forward. I'm talking right now. I want to pray for those specifically. That you're trying to go forward, but you're in a lion's den. I praise God for those of you who raised your hand. But I, I want to narrow it a bit. You're in a lion's den, or you're right at the brink of the waters, and, and the curtain's there. Maybe God's already caused the, the dark curtain to rise, and you're facing the enemy headlong. Now, now, that doesn't mean that you don't pray if you don't have your hand up. But I, I specifically want to pray for those right now. And I want to remind you how you got here. I want to remind you that the Spirit of God brought you to this place. And if that's not enough for you to have hope in, please understand that God did it because He wants to bring a change. Now, all of the rest of you in this place, it's the same story. But I want you to understand that God is saying, arise. He's ready to do battle. He's ready to vanquish your enemies. Here's what you have to commit to. Lord, whatever you do in me, I'm tired of fighting the darkness. I'm asking you through me, light it up. Light it up. Light it up, God. Do whatever you have to do to light up the darkness so that there's a light that comes forth. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you to father the fatherless, to be an advocate or judge for the widows. I'm asking you, holy God, that you'd set the lonely, that are struggling, the solitary, in a family where they feel secure, and you'll bring someone alongside them. I'm asking you, God, that not only will you protect them and keep them and be of security, but Lord, you will then break the chains and set the prisoners free, and you'll move heaven and earth earth the scripture says and just just keep seeking the Lord I didn't have time for it but I said he'd move the earth he, he'll move listen to me he'll move the heavens you read it Satan himself Satan himself will be used as a part of the instrument to bring you through 
It says God brought them into the wilderness. He brought them through the wilderness. God does not intend to leave you in the wilderness. And he'll use Satan. He'll move the heavenlies. He'll use satanic opposition to get you through. Not stuck. Through. That's what God has set his heart to do for you. That's what he's about. Now, he's also going to bring a plentiful rain and confirm his inheritance. That's what I'm going to ask him to do. If you can leave here this afternoon confirmed in your heart that God has you right where he wants you, he will confirm his inheritance even when it was weary, even when it was at a place who you wondered about, how can I go on? How can I move forward? That's what God is declaring to you. That's what he wants to do. Now listen, I'm going to close you with this. I want you just now to say, God, say this with me. God, I'm not going back. I don't know when you're going to churn the chariot wheels sideways. I don't know if you're going to lift the darkness to drive me forward. But I trust you. I believe Psalm 68 is a truth and a reality. And Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to give me the faith. You won't abandon me because I don't have enough faith. Lord, even if you're lifting the cover of the darkness to drive me forward, Whatever you have to do, I hear you, Lord. I want to be a witness to this generation. I'm asking you, God, let my life be a proclamation. Lord, use me. Change me first. But use me, Lord, for your glory. And whatever you've got to do, do it in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, I just pray over this congregation. I thank you that you brought them here. I thank you, Lord, that it's a witness and a testimony that it's not our flesh. I thank you, God. There's not a person here you do not intend to do something with. Lord, I'm asking you to start the process or complete what you've already begun of bringing them through the wilderness, even using the enemy to drive them through to the inheritance that you're going to confirm to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.